a buddleia bush, and on it, peacock butterflies, red admirals, tortoise shells. Is there anything that's more colourful, more beautiful, and more widely enjoyed in our gardens and the countryside than those butterflies? And if you get hooked on those, well, of course, there are other more modest shire beauties that will give you delights and thrills. There are small blues and fritillaries and clouded yellows and orange tips. There are actually over 50 of these gorgeous things in our countryside. Of course, it's not just that they give us great pleasure. They're also very, very important because, in a way, they are like canaries in a coal mine. They are indicators of the health of the natural world and of our environment. So knowing about them is not just a matter of pleasure and, as it were, rather abstruse and specialist delight. It's extremely valuable. Britain as a whole is quite remarkable in the number of people who take an interest butterflies, not simply as professionals, but as a, as a hobby, but do it to fully professional standards. The expert naturalist is a British tradition, which goes back to the 18th century, if not earlier, and it's one of which we're very proud. And one of the most amazing manifestations of it is this. This book is the accumulated knowledge and wisdom of hundreds, literally hundreds, of highly expert observers in Britain. They all belong to an organisation called Butterfly Conservation. And what they've produced in this marvellous book is a definitive survey of all the species of butterflies in this country, how they are getting on, where they are to be found, their habits are. It's a miraculous document and it documents a great wonder There are some 57 varieties or species of butterflies on the British list. At one species a second, that will take about a minute. So, here we go. Quite a variety, you must admit. And apart from the look of them, they each have a fascinating range of life cycles and unique behavior. They've had and will have their ups and downs. Some are winners, some seem to be losers. Can we help turn losers into winners? That's what butterfly conservation is trying to do, especially with this endangered beauty, the marsh fritillary. It's a symbol of the challenge to find out more so that more can be done to save these flying jewels, to give them a better chance in the future. Our story is a journey from Scotland south across Britain through one year, featuring the marsh fritillary along the way. We begin in Argyll in March. The snow's on the way out, the daffodils are on the way in. And earlier than usual. As the climate changes, so will the future of our butterflies. It certainly could affect the marsh fritillary. John Halliday is the Scottish Natural Heritage Warden at the Tainish Nature Reserve, famous for its scenery and excellent walking trails. One of its specialities is the marsh fritillary. As the sun warms the Scottish hills a bit earlier than usual, 
another long-term factor is revealed, the impact of grazing on the landscape. The marsh fertility is now distributed largely around the, the sort of coastal fringe and the, the islands that you can see to the, to the south of the, the Tanish Peninsula here. It's, it's a species that really does uh, fluctuate quite dramatically, so it's essential to maintain the, the habitat. And we are still doing that at Tanish by uh, bringing in cattle in the summer months. There are some live, that one's alive, but yeah, I mean, these small ones are the molted skins. So they, they'll use the webs for various reasons during the course of the development. Um, you know, they obviously bask on the, the web when they're more so in the autumn when the, the larvae are much smaller. But they're at a stage now where they're probably going through their final molt. So they've molted in that web and you'll see how they're now dispersing away from the web and they'll go in search of the devil's bit scabious, the food plant that's scattered around in this, in this general area. You could say the future of this species depends on these little caterpillars and certainly on information sent in to butterfly conservation by John Halliday and others around the country. So much for the website of the Marsh Fritillary on Tainish. As well as grazing by sheep and cattle, this area has been much altered by forestry practices. The original deciduous woodland, perhaps not suitable for the Marsh Fritillary at the time, once cleared might have helped matters. But then conifers were planted, not much good for wildlife, but providing jobs and exports for a community that needed work and money. So, the future of many of our butterflies is no simple matter. There are connections in all directions, and our countryside has now become a huge landscape management challenge. Our flora and fauna has changed increasingly quickly. Plants, like these skunk cabbages introduced from the United States, now dominate a nearby Scottish valley. But on more open ground, deforestation, followed by heavy grazing by more and more sheep, produces conditions unsuitable for marsh fritillaries. Cattle leave longer vegetation, which is better, certainly better for this butterfly. They plough the fields and scatter manure upon the land. Highland cattle make an impact not only in themselves, but on the land, be it individual hoof prints or a communal footprint on the whole scene. Not far away, as the barnacle goose or eider duck flies, or perhaps even a fritillary, is the wonderful island of Isla, a wildlife and butterfly jewel. The eiders disperse as the ferry pulls into Port Ellen. Scottish flag flapping strongly in the wind that blows so much in these exposed parts. Smaller sheltered harbours protect traditional fishing communities and the local seals enjoy some facilities, though fishermen and seals don't always see eye to eye when it comes to catching fish. Inland there is much of interest too, the famous flocks of barnacle geese, otters, deer and down there in the grass our friend the little marsh fritillary. The grass and the grazing are important here too, whether it's by beak or teeth. Between them, geese and sheep have mown Isla into a submission of a green, well-manicured and well-manured sward. Like seals and fish, it's geese and grass, not always easy.
kites, not the bird sort, and some with strings attached hover overhead and attempt to protect the pastures below. No place there for marsh fritillaries, but around it, now that's a different matter. This part of Isla is a reserve of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds and, as it happens, for the protection of marsh fritillaries. Clive Mackay is part of the network of enthusiasts, more of a web work perhaps, and he's discovering another website. What I'm doing is recording the, the number of larvae on each web and the height of the web in the vegetation and the vegetation type that the caterpillars are using. This is web number K15B. They are just about ready to molt, I think. They may just be building a molt web now, ready to move from the fourth instar into the fifth instar. Instars are stages of the caterpillar's growth, molting as they go. They like to sun themselves on pale backgrounds, like their web or dry grass. With lots of cloud today, Clive provides his own sunshine. Sort of spinning the web. You see, there's one on the left there. Got him. Twirling around. Probably all making their own contribution to building the web. Nice south facing, with almost a basket effect of of millennia. Very pale millennia stems. And the web's built against that to reflect the sunlight to maximise the heat that they can gather from it. And one of the most amazing things about marsh fritillaries is that they need to raise their body temperature to 35 degrees centigrade to be able to digest the scabious that they have eaten. So if the weather isn't good, uh, they're really struggling. Uh, one of the, uh, this good West Highland weather, uh, one of the benefits of the misty rainy weather is that you catch the, the raindrops on the web and this makes spotting the webs and the caterpillars much easier when I'm doing searches in the autumn and the spring. So it's a very important feature of the landscape that uh, the scabious needs to germinate is open ground. And in an area like this, this is provided by the cattle hoof prints. Here's, here's a good example. You can see here where we've got a few hoof prints quite close together in this soft peaty ground. At the back of one of these is a small scabious plant probably a year old, probably germinated last year, just coming up. So the fabric of the landscape is in fact a web of life, very much in our hands. How we maintain that fabric or web, whether it's via sheep or geese, and protecting or not animals and plants, is crucial for the future of all concerned. As the geese leave Isla in April for their Arctic breeding grounds, we too will leave the marsh fritillary story to look at other butterflies in Britain, to see how they fit into their surroundings, whether they're winning or losing, and how they can be helped. We'll move from the commonest to the rarest, from the familiar to the most elusive, and sometimes the most endangered. This is a displaying pair of large whites, or cabbage whites, one of our commonest species. Some might call it a pest, especially farmers or gardeners, but its caterpillars eat a wide range of plants, natural ones as well as garden crops. Its smaller relatives, the small white and green-veined white, are also common and conspicuous even when in deep foliage. and the orange tip, prettily on the wing in early spring.
Apart from our effect on the landscape, such as providing extra food sources from our crops, there are also natural factors that butterflies have to contend with. The spider, neatly packaging its prey, must also eat. And there can be literally millions of spiders in a large field. Now for a white for all seasons, the brimstone. As early as February, you might see one over a green field or through brown buckthorn woodland and over the primroses. Then in April and May, nightingale territory, when many of the bird migrants arrive. As the leaves unfurl, the brimstone switches its diet to the nectar of whatever is in bloom at the time. It occurs all across southern England, where, as ever, its future depends on land use and, as for some other species, water use. In fact, you could say land use is water use. What's put on the land runs off to streams, rivers, ponds, lakes and ultimately, perhaps, to the sea. Livestock may be part of these connections, and even though a Dorset chalk stream may look clean and pure with its brown trout, its chemical content may suggest otherwise. Environmentally sensitive indicators, like aquatic birds and insects, may prove to be a warning about the health of the countryside. Tracked through the food chain, these coots are well worth watching, not just for their own sake, but because of what they're living in. Down there does connect with up here, where what may look to visitors like a natural grassy field is in fact a chemically controlled habitat actually inhabited by very little, except grass. But as farming policy changes in favour of nature, it could be the outlook for the potential butterfly enthusiast is slowly improving. Certainly awareness is increasing along with pressures on our countryside. Butterfly conservation links up with other agencies, which makes good sense, in that everything is now seen to be interconnected, be it people out for a walk up here, to villagers down there in the valley, to sheep grazing up here, all responsible in their way for the future of butterflies. But of course, it's us, or the farmer on behalf of us as customers, who decide whether this field is basically for sheep and grass only, effectively a monoculture. Or it could be like this, one of the classic sites at Fontmel Down, the cowslip meadow, a glimpse of what used to be. 60% of our flowering downland has disappeared in the last 80 years. Now, our cameraman, Gareth Trezise, has to pick his spot to get pictures like this. back to the Brimston, part of a changing, managed landscape where it can be seen in every month of the year along with the buzzard now on the increase. Not so for the Brimstone, yet. Buckthorn is what the Brimstone needs for its caterpillars. It hibernates as a butterfly in evergreens. Types of plants are so crucial to butterflies. Conifers tend not to support much diversity, compared with deciduous trees and shrubs. But for our last true and rarest white, there's a twist to the story. Wood whites thrive along rides and woodland edges, 
happened when conifers were planted in the 1950s and 60s to replace ancient woodland, the resulting edge habitat helped the wood white, though many other butterflies suffered at the same time. So, as it happened, coniferization was good for the species at the time. And in Ireland, the wood white has done quite well in the past. For the future, a lot depends on coppicing even the maintenance of old railway lines where the males patrol the edges in search of a mate. Marbled white is more of a brown than a white. It's also an edge lover, and those lifelines along roads, in terms of total length, represent a huge linear habitat for this striking butterfly. Planned cutting of roadside verges can be a local responsibility, and butterfly conservation can advise local authorities how and when to do it. It can certainly look attractive. The hedge brown, or gatekeeper, also benefits from the verge effect. Many miles of hedgerows, some very ancient, help support a large population of this species in southern England, and it's expanding northwards, perhaps as a response to climate change. And the meadow brown occurs right across Britain, adapting where it can, now moving to town. The variations in its eye spots have been used by geneticists for regional studies. In fact, eye spots, as on this wall butterfly, can be very conspicuous. Do they deter a predator or draw attention? The grayling. Now you see it, now you don't. The ringlet. No doubt why this one has its name. Climate change certainly seems to have helped the speckled wood. Males will occupy a sunny patch and defend it vigorously. Those with darker wing colour can warm up more quickly and can therefore spend more time patrolling their territories. Climate may help it, but, as always, it will need somewhere to live and it can be encouraged into parks and gardens with a little help from its friends. and the small heath, appropriately feeding deep in the heather, comes and goes with its eye spot. It's almost as if it's watching you. Compared to the widely distributed small heath, the large heath is much more restricted. Butterfly Conservation's partners in the local wildlife trust in Cumbria have managed to protect its home just beyond these trees. Like the butterfly itself, and very much linked to it, these peat bogs are becoming increasingly rare. Near the edge of the Lake District, such wet places are under continuous threat. Drainage, overgrazing, and especially the demand for garden peat affect this butterfly. And Ireland is no exception. The Scotch Argus also occurs rarely in northern England. One classic site is in Cumbria, where it flies across unimproved grassland in a spectacular setting at Arnside Knot, a National Trust site. Today, they're heading for a special food supply across these windswept uplands. Hemp agrimony forms a little oasis in this limestone grassland. Further north, in Scotland, it seems to be safe enough, 
though it's declined over much of Europe. But probably the rarest brown in Britain is up here in Scotland. The highlands have been deforested and too heavily grazed in many places. Now, at the National Nature Reserve at Ben Laws, for example, changes are being made. Not only is there a field station and visitor centre nearby, but paths lead you to glimpses of the original vegetation. Fences keep sheep out and allow insect-eating plants like butterwort to survive. They're found alongside sanctifoil and shrubs with moth species attached. And down there, in the grass, the caterpillar of that local speciality, the mountain ringlet butterfly. They've hibernated through the changeable Scottish weather and will continue feeding until the butterfly emerges from the pupa at an unpredictable time in June or July. The mountain ringlet is very much at the mercy of the conditions. To some extent, it can adjust by choosing the north or south facing slopes to get the right temperature. But when it comes to higher altitude, there could be more of a problem. As climate change continues, the butterfly could be forced up and up, trying to find somewhere cool, until there's nowhere else to go. As we burn more and more fossil fuels, could we and others abroad inadvertently be threatening the existence of this unobtrusive little butterfly? This ringlit upper mountain could well prove to be another canary in the coal mine for the human race. Meanwhile, high on the lonely mountaintop, scientists look for climate change clues in the mist, sometimes the snow, and increasingly often in that famous Scottish rain. Into Ireland. To Donegal where marsh fritillary butterflies once swamped houses, blocking doorways and raising questions in London's Houses of Parliament about a marsh fritillary plague. Ireland has 28 resident species of butterfly, about half of the British total, due to its isolation by the Irish Sea. In the past, development was fairly slow and the country's landscape was sympathetic to butterflies, still mainly rural, and that magic word unimproved. But like many other countries, Ireland has changed a lot in the European political context. So decisions now made in Brussels about land use may have far-reaching results on the ground, literally in some corners of Ireland. High ground, the lower ground, and the cattle business, and the quality of water. They may all be affected. And there's often plenty of water in Ireland. Marsh fritillary suggests wetness, and here at a local reserve, Bob Oldwell, a local volunteer with butterfly conservation, prepares for a wet outing. So here we are in Bunduff in County Sligo in northwestern Ireland. The castle in the background there is Classybourne Castle, formerly owned by the Mountbatten family. The area that we're standing on here is an extensive damp meadow with a carpet of devil's bit scabious and considerable quantities of nice nectar sources including um, buttercups and various types of uh, orchids. The requirements of a butterfly of course are that it has adequate uh, quantities of its larval food plant, which in Ireland, in any case, for the marsh fertility, is the devil's bit scabious. 
but the adults, when they are flying for the fortnight or three weeks of their existence, require considerable quantities of nectar. And in this area here, they mainly take it from either the orchids, but in particular from the buttercups. As the cattle business expands, grazing pressures, drainage and other farming practices quickly change. And so protection of special butterfly habitat is urgently needed. Increasingly, the public is becoming aware of the importance of wild places. Tourism is a major earner in Ireland, and its empty shorelines, albeit often on the damp side, are a great asset. Leaving the marsh fertility story for a while, we visit the site of an old abbey on the coast of Cornwall. Here, in extensive, peacefully protected sand dunes, live ants. And because of them, this little blue, the silver studded, thrives. Their caterpillars are tended by ants, as are those of the much rarer large blue. The silver studded blues elsewhere also live on lowland heather and chalk grassland. As its homes have steadily been reduced and fragmented, it's only just hanging on in many places. However, it's been successfully reintroduced in other sites. As far as habitat goes, there's much less of a problem with the aptly named common blue. It comes in two colors, male and female. The brown Argus. And amongst the harebells and other limestone plants, you might spot the very similar northern brown Argus. We're talking whole communities here, many insects and many plants, often influenced by another form of grazing, that Roman import, the rabbit. Myxomatosis has reduced its impact, but when rabbits die off, the vegetation increases, sometimes to the detriment of butterflies. More plant diversity, more insect diversity. The Adonis Blues fortunes have also fluctuated with the rabbit population. It likes warm, short chalk grassland and only occurs in southern England, which is on the northern climate edge of its European range. Whether warmer weather in the future will help the Adonis remains to be seen. But its dazzling brightness will surely be welcome wherever it can expand its range across the downlands of Britain. Like the Adonis blue, the Chalk Hill blue lives in close colonies, though males are mobile and have been known to travel up to 20 kilometers from their home.
Though blues are mainly grassland occupants, some have moved into other communities. Being buzzed by a bee on a bramble flower is the holly blue, identified by its sparse spots on a blue-only underside. It lays its eggs on holly for the spring generation, but on ivy for the second summer generation. So it does well in churchyards, safe sanctuaries often providing the holly and the ivy together. The small blue's sole food plant is the kidney vetch, a kind of pea. It's our smallest resident butterfly and is easily overlooked, except perhaps on a romantic occasion like this. Fortunately, breeding conditions for the small blue appear quite simple to create, so we should be able to improve their chances for the future. It's much more difficult for its larger cousin, the almost legendary large blue. It's such a star that hundreds of people come from all over Britain on special open days. They're looking for a species that became extinct in 1979, but has now been reintroduced from Sweden and is making a strong comeback with concerted support from butterfly conservation and its many conservation partners. This special site in Somerset is carefully controlled as enthusiasts try to get that special picture of a very special butterfly. Will my flash your at your... No, you carry on. Part of the difficulty of saving this species is its strange lifestyle. The large blue is famous for its intriguing relationship with red ants, which will take the caterpillar into their nest below ground. The ants are attracted by sweet secretions from a special honey gland. By mimicking an ant grub, the caterpillar gets picked up and taken down to the ant's brood chamber. There it will hibernate, then pupate, eventually emerging in early May, possibly in front of a delighted audience. In conservation, communication counts. As we move from the rarest of the blues to the skippers, here's another story of winning and losing and winning, eventually. Here in Scotland is the vital spot for the checkered skipper. It became extinct in England in 1976, but is doing well now north of the border, including at one of Butterfly Conservation's reserves at Loch Arkeg. Its survival here seems to depend on climate and geology. It's relatively mild, with a high rainfall and a long growing season enabling a successful life cycle on its caterpillar diet of coarse grass. The vegetation is affected by browsing deer and it's important to try and produce a suitable mix of woodland edge and open areas which the checkered skipper will find to its liking. Again, landscape management is essential to survival. Perhaps its original home in the East Midlands can be restored and butterfly conservation is investigating just such a plan. It's the rarest British skipper, one of eight remarkably similarly designed species. The fortunes of the skippers vary in contrast to their standard body shape. As we've seen, the checkered has been and gone in England but is okay in Scotland for now. The Essex is spreading, 
so is the small skipper. The large is also spreading northwards. The silver spotted has declined rapidly on southern downs, but has partially recovered. The grizzled seems to be in trouble. And the dingy skipper has declined seriously too. Now to the last of the eight, the Lulworth skipper, an interesting combination. First discovered in 1832, it's thrived in a relatively tiny patch of the south coast of England. But there's a large number in a small area. Military ranges have helped it, as well as grazing and burning management recommended by Butterfly Conservation, which happens to be just up the road from their head office at East Lulworth. The splendid offices are leased from the Lulworth estate and house most of the society's staff. Other staff are based at smaller offices in Scotland, <laughs> Wales and Northern Ireland and around the English regions. Like a model showing off a glittering gown, the green hair streak shows how every scale, or should it be sequin, counts in the colour and the design of the wings. The hair streaks come in a beautiful variety of colours, purple, brown, white letter and black. And people gather on special field outings to track them down, though those colours don't make them easy to find amongst a wall of green and brown. <laughs> it's quite clearly in view. Yeah. 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 See the hollow there? Yeah, um, if, you, if you line up on the, the, the lens and look up, you can actually see it quite, oh, quite well with your eye. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. But sometimes you're lucky and one comes down a bit like this rare black hair streak. Then, if you're even luckier, it will pose nicely for a moment before disappearing again. The hair streaks are an elusive bunch. The purple is widespread and keeps mostly to the tops of oaks. It may well be expanding its range. The white letter hair streak also favours treetops, and as its caterpillar feeds on various types of elm, it's suffered a setback because of Dutch elm disease, but now it seems to be recovering. The brown hair streak is elusive too, either high in the tree canopy or hidden in hedgerows, often including blackthorn, its food plant. Hedges, like verges, can be crucial to some butterflies. Removal or badly timed cutting are bad news nationwide. And here in South Wales, as we rejoin the marsh fritillary story in late June, farming practices yet again come into the picture. Just by the motorway is a butterfly conservation reserve. Neil Jones is the local volunteer warden and knows it well and his father was a previous warden. We can see why they've been called um, a stained glass windows fluttering in the grass. They've got a lovely intricate pattern of uh, browns and uh, yellows and different colours. Well, the Welsh name for the marsh fritillary is Brithega Gors, which literally means the spotted one of the bog. I think it's, I think it's sort of really a translation of the English. A lot of the Welsh names are, unfortunately, but... It's, uh, it's feeding on a, a, a me meadow thistle, and the Welsh for that is a scatlin a, 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 a thol, which means thistle of the meadow. So again, it's another sort of translation, really. In previous years, we found quite a few egg batches in this area. The problem we have, of course, is getting graziers. That's the, that's the difficulty, is finding people with the appropriate stock who are prepared to graze land like this. And it can be rather difficult. Uh, it's not desperately bad here yet, and we've still got the butterflies in reasonable numbers with our looks. They, they, they love this meadow thistle, this is the these are the places to find them. 
we did see plenty of caterpillars earlier on, so I think they're doing okay. You can see him sticking his little proboscis in and out of the little individual flowers of the thistle. And they're just... He's quite absorbed in this particular flower. He spent quite a few minutes just hovering around, just popping up and down into each of the individual florets. It's a very good nectar source. This is a patch of scrub that we actually cut back during the winter. As you can see, it's still coming back up a bit, but uh, it'll probably have to be tackled again. But at least there's, um, there's not as much as there was before. I mean, this is quite a large tree, which was... You can see if you... There was quite a large tree there. This is the problem. It isn't... The site wasn't always grazed very well before we bought it, and we haven't quite got the grazing quite right. But uh, so we're doing some management by hand just to prevent the scrub taking over. Tree management is relevant too as we come to the fritillaries as a group. Besides our symbolic marsh fritillary, there are seven other resident species in this rather bafflingly similar family. This, the silver washed, is the commonest, or rather least rare. It likes mature deciduous woodland with glades, often man-made. There, it can display with great precision. In this case, more of a car park than a glade. Most of the fritillaries can be identified by the pattern on their underwings. The background literally can be another clue, from woodland to moorland and bracken for the high brown. Status declining in many cases. and the dark green fritillary declining too. But butterfly conservation is part of active efforts to save it. Another contrast, the Glanville fritillary, found only on the coast in a very limited area in southern England. Woodland edge where the pylons stride cross country, home of the small pearl bordered. Status has declined rapidly, now highly threatened.
And finally, to the one that's been saved from the brink of extinction, the heath fritillary, here on heather. It presented a huge challenge to conservationists because of its ephemeral requirements. Following a 1980s survey, it was found that it depended on a combination of coppicing, grazing and burning. Even Prince Charles joined in to help with management on his Duchy of Cornwall estate. As an encouragement to achieve a better future for better butterflies, the recent example of the Heath Fritillary is a classic. Another speciality can be found, if you're very lucky, in the woodlands of southern England. No, it's not this Red Admiral, but it shares the same interest in animal droppings. No, it's not the White Admiral, though it will sometimes come down from the treetops to bracken level, or even to ground level, like the peacock for some reason on a feather and a camera. My dad. <laughs> How about banana skins in a desperate attempt to bring down an emperor from on high? The diary from the notice board at Bentley Wood Car Park whets the appetite with mention of a brief appearance on a car bonnet, on dog droppings, and even an entry about a lonely marsh fritillary. Of course, the silver-washed fritillaries are nice, especially on the ground as they search for minerals. David Lambert, the local warden, is on hand as they wait and wait by the so-called master oak. Watching the females of the Valetsina form of the silver-washed fertility passes the time. She's laying eggs on the great oak. This one looks rather beaten up. Soon, a big crowd assembles. And, at long last, a glimpse of the star attraction. A purple emperor, high on the master oak. That's where they display and feed on honeydew. But you don't have to wait by an oak tree in the middle of nowhere to see beautiful butterflies. As the warden leaves Bentley Wood, he could be heading home to something much more accessible. Some call them the glamour group, and they just love Budlia, the butterfly bush. Red admirals, small tortoiseshells, and that elegant traveller, the painted lady. They're here in numbers, feasting on each tiny floret of the Budlia, originally from China. They've come from North Africa and the Mediterranean. The painted lady lays her eggs among stinging nettle spines. Those are what break off and sting you. The design of the egg varies with different butterflies. Compared with a pinhead and greenfly, it's extraordinary to think what it will lead to in a few weeks' time. Here, speeded up, the caterpillar eats the eggshell.
then feeds furiously, molting as it grows. Hangs up, and inside its body becomes a sort of soup. which reforms in the chrysalis or pupa. The dead head drops off. The internal soup is now a tight package. In fact, a painted lady butterfly. Antennae, proboscis. The wings are pumped up. And the perfect painted lady appears just a month or so from being a minute egg. And it can be mass production with several broods right through the summer. 1996 saw a huge immigration with other visitors like silver wire moths and the exotic looking hummingbird hawk moth. most glamorous of the glamour group, you must explore the Norfolk Broads. Boats for tourists, reeds for roofs. The Broads are flooded medieval peat diggings, linked by rivers. It's a rich habitat for plants, birds and insects, like this trio of mating damselflies. But these visitors have come here mainly to see Britain's biggest butterfly, the swallowtail. Just a glimpse. It's a powerful flyer across the reed beds. Before it settles down to feed. In the past, drainage by windmills was a problem, but continued conservation action is now paying off. So, as we complete our review of Britain's butterflies, are we becoming better or worse off? Two big factors keep appearing, the landscape and the climate. Farming and weather, both unpredictable. They have changed, are changing, and will change, that's for sure. Will wind bring new species to join our 57 varieties? Can the residents hang on, like this pair of mating blues, whilst the landscape changes around them? Will the map butterfly extend its map across Europe to join what we already have, like the brimstone and the ringlet? Or will we lose some, such as the black-veined white, which is now sadly extinct in Britain? Why, we don't know for certain. It's still common on the continent. On a Budlier at Butterfly Conservation's head office in Dorset, one of these turned up. A monarch, that famous traveller from the United States which regularly migrates to Mexico, but only very rarely crosses the Atlantic. Across the English Channel, along with painted ladies, we receive varying numbers of clouded yellows every year. 
In fact, many insects travel far and wide, from the famous locusts, which may even be coming our way with a climate change, to swarms of hoverflies, many moths and dragonflies. We have introduced a cousin of our resident small copper, the large copper. The British race has been extinct for 150 years, and efforts have been made to establish the Dutch race over here, but only with mixed success. So there are the winners and the losers, the travellers and the stay-at-homes, those that are expanding vigorously like the comma with its appropriate markings, or the Duke of Burgundy declining and increasingly limited to tiny sites where each holds a tiny territory. The challenge for butterfly conservation is to turn losers into winners, to reverse the causes of decline, to encourage the public and professionals to make a difference. As a good example, we return to the Marsh Fritillary in Devon in southwest England, a long way from Scotland where we began our story in early spring. Then the overwintering caterpillars were warming up in their webs on the devil's bit scabious leaves. Now, on the same kind of plants seven months later and 500 miles to the south, we're in no man's land. In fact, these are the calm grasslands of East Devon. Two contrasts, green, drained, fertilised, no good for marsh fertilities, or the original unimproved condition. Today, it's a meeting place for a butterfly conservation event. Dr Caroline Bullman really knows her marsh fertilities, and this is an event to help landowners care for the land and the butterflies that live there. They hope to recruit okay. some more well, members today. Um, I'm just going to briefly go through the life cycle and the ecology of the marsh artillery. Um, the adult flies during May and June, and they lay their eggs on this plant here, which is flowering at this time of year, which is devil's bit scabious. And she lays her eggs, she lays a batch of eggs on the underside of um, the larger leaves. She lays up to about 300 eggs. And then as these develop, after a few weeks, they then hatch as caterpillars and that's the stage that we can see now. Uh, so during August and September they're still active as caterpillars and they, the, the, the uh, group remain together and they use that um, as a mechanism to avoid predators. Goodness, so it really is, that really is there. Yeah, the, yeah, the only thing to, that you might confuse that with is a spider's web. Yeah. The spider oh, yeah. nest, oh, yeah. that they form a quite yeah. dense nest. Well, these, these caterpillars are probably only a couple of weeks off um, going into hibernation. They'll have um, hatched in July. And they're actually forming a new web at the moment. Um, and have moved on to a new plant, a new devil's bit scabious plant on which to feed. To help provide a better future for our butterflies and moths, you too can join in, either by supporting from home or in the field. It all helps. We do or not, I don't know. But, um, but now the areas are being reclaimed. Possibly, right. is it? I don't know, I mean, I have no idea. But well, rather is, than this... That, that is so scrub that was, which we see it. I don't think you have time. It can be an individual effort, walking transects, taking notes, which ultimately lead to a better butterfly atlas. Anyone want to take a picture of this marsh for it? For it. 
Or it can be a team effort, looking for marsh fritillaries, or being looked at by a curious roe deer. It can be one tiny butterfly in a big landscape. Or a small protected patch, an oasis perhaps for butterflies and moths, at Tor Cross in South Devon. Even for a great green grasshopper. and home for a Jersey tiger, a rare day-flying moth. But of course, most moths fly at night, and a harmless moth trap is an exciting way of getting to grips with them. Dusky thorn. It's the dusky thorn. It's a sort of late summer moth, um, fairly typical. Uh, it's one of the group of moths called the thorns. And you can see the sort of jagged edge to the wing. It's fairly typical. Mark Parsons shows Martin Warren dusky and some thorns, staff yeah, from Butterfly thorns, Conservation. Are related thorn species, they're the sort of late summer mm. species. Are we likely to get any more different thorns in this trap at the same time? Um, at this time of year you can get the canary shouldered thorn. A south coast speciality. Oh, uh, that's the that. L album wainscot. You can see the white L on the forewing. And it really is quite a coastal species and it's quite nice to see here. And, uh, with the, west, the southwesterly winds last night. About two and a half thousand species in this country. But, uh, um, this one, I'd hazard a guess, was probably born in this country, but the, its parents probably came from the Mediterranean. Attracted by a light resting in egg boxes, just a sample of our many moths found from sea level to mountain top. There's a, a blood oh, famous jet black on the forewings to a sort of vinous red. Cleverly hidden, or extremely conspicuous, to frighten predators from the garden fuchsia, like the eye spots of the elephant hawk moth caterpillar. to the dramatic death's head hawk moth caterpillar, here munching on potato leaves, perhaps in your garden. From this wide-ranging combination of butterflies and moths, we've chosen the marsh fritillary as our symbol over a year and across Britain. It's a focus of butterfly conservation action. Whether it turns out to be a winner or a loser is up to us. It's important for all of us to keep it safely on the British list and to ensure a better future for all those living jewels.